Salmonella outbreak from eggs sickens 38 and 7 states. Ground beef producer issues recall due to deadly E. coli outbreak. Americans told to stop eating all romaine lettuce. General Mills gold medal unbleached flour recalled over salmonella fears. These are but a few headlines, and just from the past several months, food safety outbreaks seem to be occurring more and more with tragic consequences in some cases. Our guest, infectious disease epidemiologist, Dr. Michael Osterholm, can explain why. I'm Kelly Brownell, director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University and professor of public policy at Duke. Welcome to the Leading Voices in Food. Michael Osterholm is director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. In 2018 and 19, he served as science envoy for health security on behalf of the U.S. Department of State. He is the author of the 2017 book entitled Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. He is widely regarded as a leading expert on infectious disease and recognized for his work far and wide. So things have changed a lot with food policy over the years. And Mike, when I was growing up, people spoke about trichinosis from not cooking pork sufficiently, but that was just about it. So how is the picture different today? Well, first of all, Kelly, thank you very much for having me on as a guest. It's a great honor. Let me just say that the epidemiology of foodborne disease has probably changed as much as any epidemiology or uh, disease occurrence pattern uh, in all the years I've been in this business. And it's largely due to the fact that we eat very different foods today. When people say that we have the safest food supply in the world here in the United States, my response is we have the world's food supply. So today we find food sourced from around the world. We find it produced in uh, very different ways than it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago, where uh, seasonal fruits and vegetables, leafy greens, were just that seasonal. Today, we have them 365 days a year. We chase the sun around the world, often in low or middle-income countries. We are very different about uh, selection of what we have today. 30 years ago, in a grocery store, it was not unusual to have several thousand different choices to make today in the supermarket of the 21st century. Uh, you, we often see uh, 65 to 100,000 different SKUs or potential items available. So it's really the complexity and the location of where that food supply comes today that changes what it is that we're experiencing with foodborne disease. And has that changed the likelihood that foodborne uh, diseases will occur in outbreaks, or has it also affected the type of diseases that one, one gets transmitted through food? Well, we actually see both. It used to be that years ago, if one traveled to a developing world country or low-income country, you worried about developing traveler's diarrhea. Today, you don't have to leave your home to develop traveler's diarrhea. Uh, depending on what food item you're eating and how it is prepared. A good example is a parasitic disease called cyclospora. And uh, in this case, uh, this is a disease that we often saw in low-income, middle-income countries. Uh, and today, we see it here now right in the United States occurring where product produced here. And it's in part due to the fact that uh, the workers likely play a major role. And today, we see an ever-changing complexion of who the workers are that are out in the fields doing the work to bring us our produce. We see this in terms of such things as a, a product like sprouts, where today almost all the sprout seeds in the world actually come from outside the United States to make sprouts. And again, the potential for disease transmission is there. But we also see the complexity of even our U.S. system. For example, today in the ways that we grow cattle and pigs and poultry, we often see very large numbers of animals brought together in large confinement operations where a, a bacteria like E. coli or a virus like influenza in chickens can basically spread in such a way that it, it wasn't what we used to see when, when uh, you know, grandpa used to have the farm with 25 head of cattle. Uh, so even in the United States, we see the potential for the development and the transmission of infectious agents is very different. So what, what are the most common foodborne illnesses and which are the most dangerous? Well, interestingly enough, it's actually in large part not due to production in that sense if you look at the most common. Today, norovirus, which is a virus that causes vomiting and diarrhea 24 to 36 hours after exposure, is probably the one of the leading pathogens we deal with, and that is actually transmitted by food handlers. 
But today, why is that important? Because we spend such a large proportion, well, up to half of all of our food dollars are spent eating out of home at restaurants where, again, one sick food handler can uh, transmit this virus to many, many different individuals with uh, the type of food that they prepare. So that's one thing. We do see, however, also a substantial number of salmonella infections, Campylobacter, the kind of E. coli uh, bacteria infections that we often hear about with leafy green uh, production. And these are most often tied to production. They're tied to uh, either contaminated water, having contact with leafy greens or produce of some kind, or transmission of salmonella or E. coli within cattle or poultry. These are all challenges today that we see in this country. So how vulnerable are the major food companies to outbreaks that occur in their products? Like we mentioned, General Mills Gold Medal Flour, that's a major company and a very common product. Are the, are the companies legally liable for things that happen here? Are they reputationally liable? or what, how, are, how are they vulnerable? Well, clearly, food safety has become an ever-increasingly complex issue to deal with. Surely, these companies do uh, realize that they are at risk. And in most cases, we see companies doing everything they can, at least reasonable, to, to eliminate the risk of foodborne disease. Uh, you know, for as many of the outbreaks that we hear about uh, and the number of cases of disease, it's still a very, very small proportion of, of, at most, uh, less than a percent of all meals ever result in a foodborne disease transmission in this country. So we need to put that in perspective. It's just that when you have 300 million people eating three meals a day and munching a lot more in between, that you have that potential for disease occurrence to happen. I think that today we do have occasionally companies that are what I would call bad actors, where uh, they intentionally knew they had a problem and tended to cover it up. We've had some very notable ones with eggs peanut butter, several companies where they they falsified data to show that the product was safer than it really was by testing. But that's rare. That's very, very rare. On a whole, most companies are trying to do the right thing, and they recognize the cost of not doing that, both reputationally, as you noted, and as well as just strict liability. So in the United States, where does authority fall for testing and monitoring food safety? Well, this is one of the challenges we have is, is that there isn't one specific place. Food safety in this country has been carved up between the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Agriculture with some overlap in the Department of Commerce, for example, for seafood or talking about certain toxicological issues with the EPA. And what we really need, and I was part of the National Academy of Medicine at that time called the Institute of Medicine Committee some years ago that called for a single food safety agency in this country. I still support that very much. I think it would really dramatically improve our ability to respond. Today, for example, if you're a pizza manufacturing uh, plant, if you basically have pizza and you put cheese on it, that falls under the, the uh, FDA. But if you put cheese and meat on it, it falls under the USDA. And so there's real challenges in terms of trying to provide for a comprehensive and coordinated effort. Uh, the same is true with the number of committees. It varies from year to year, but as many as more than 20 committees on the Hill uh, in Congress have some authority over foodborne disease safety, uh, that, that's a real challenge. And so to, to us right now, uh, I think uh, many of us would love to see a single food safety agency that would uh, basically be forked to table. And then if an outbreak occurs, even including the investigative opportunity to to understand what's going on and stop it. Certainly seems to make sense. Why in the world hasn't it happened? Well, I think it's uh, called uh, territory. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> people all have government agency carve-outs where they have been doing this for years. There's congressional committees that don't want to give up their authority uh, over this issue. And despite numerous recommendations to the contrary, we just don't seem to be able to get a single food safety agency, which I think would be a really uh, a wise investment in food safety overall. And I think the private sector would actually benefit from having a more comprehensive and coordinated food safety approach in this country. Mike, you alluded earlier to the fact that the food supply is so global. So in a given day, one could eat foods that are coming in from a number of different countries. I imagine that makes monitoring even more complex. Is that right? It does. And in fact, if you are actually requiring your food safety program to hinge on monitoring, you're already in trouble. What we've got to do is be out in the fields 
We've got to be in the plants and making certain that we're doing everything we can to provide for the safest condition, good agricultural practices, good manufacturing practices. If you try to test your way out of a food safety problem, you're never going to do that. Um, you just couldn't test enough product, and uh, uh, you've got to assure that, uh, that that product's safe. Part of that is due to the fact not just the number of samples, but when we mass produce food today, and we've been involved with Outbreak, where you can have many thousands of gallons of ice cream made or uh, pounds of a product made, in which the contamination is very, very sporadic. And you could test it till you're blue in the face. You wouldn't pick up the contamination. But feed that to people who become the ultimate bioassay, and you could have hundreds of thousands of cases with that mass-produced food. So our job really is to also move food safety to the very origin of the food production process, to the fields, to wherever it may be, and into the plants. That's hard to do when you have a very limited Food and Drug Administration with limited authority to be in other countries, and that's where companies become very important. The second area I just have to note that's become an ever-increasing a challenge, and it's one that is going to be even more of a challenge in the future related to climate change, is water. The availability of potable water that's safe, that can be used for irrigation, that can be used for manufacturing, that can be used for, for uh, washing equipment and hands and so forth, is really a, a major issue for us around the world. And so I only see this becoming more and more of a problem as the availability of, of water, and particularly potable water, uh, becomes more challenged with, with climate change. Well, Mike, given that uh, our listeners are living this day to day because we all eat, are there things people can do to minimize their risk? Well, I think, first of all, you know, the challenge we often see are not those of some mystery food, but just good hygiene in the kitchen. You know, you have to assume that eggs are contaminated with salmonella or campylobacter. How many times in the kitchen do we forget that and we cross contaminate our kitchens or we bring in raw meat? And we cut it on the cutting board and then turn around and cut the salad up that's on that same cutting board. And so just good uh, safety practices in the kitchen in and of themselves can be very, very important. Uh, the second thing is, again, buying food that is, in a sense, you might say, from reputable sources. I mean, most of the major grocery stores and, uh, and food uh, sources today are buying from companies where they're putting the responsibility back on the uh, the food production companies to provide a safe food supply. And if they don't, they're not going to be sold. And so I think that, you know, it, it's it's clear that if you buy food from most grocery stores today, that's a safer bet than buying it from, say, uh, 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 unlicensed or unapproved sources. We see today, you know, more and more markets and so forth starting. And, and that is a challenge in terms of assuring that food safety is uh, being adhered to in those otherwise largely unregulated markets. Well, Mike, thanks for your pioneering work on this, and we appreciate your efforts and the efforts of you and your colleagues to help keep the food supply safe, and I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Our guest has been Professor Michael Osterholm of the University of Minnesota and author of the book, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. And thank you so much for listening. If you would like to subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food, you may do so at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Apple Podcasts, or you can visit the website of the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.